Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Hockey Journey Podcast, episode number 110, Face-Offs, Tips, and More with Taylor Williamson, presented to you by OnlineHockeyTraining.com. I'm your host, Coach Lance Pitlick. If you're new here, please make sure you subscribe so you won't miss out on any future episodes. Before we end a summer of consistent, persistent, and process-oriented training and begin this conversation, if you want to learn more about me, my hockey experiences, what I know, and most importantly, how I've been helping hockey players get really good with a stick and puck, just head on over to OnlineHockeyTraining.com, that's OnlineHockeyTraining.com, and gain instant access to my 10-part video series where I'll show you everything. Consider it my gift to you. Lastly, if you live in Minnesota or are visiting the state of hockey sometime soon and you want to schedule an in-person off-ice stick skills lesson, I'd love to have the opportunity to show you my little world. Go to sweethockeycoach.com, that's sweethockeycoach.com, and watch the video on the homepage for instructions. Thanks, and I look forward to working with you sometime soon. I can't tell you how happy I am to be back producing an episode for the Hockey Journey podcast. Over Labor Day weekend, I picked up the COVID, passed it on to my wife and my parents, so I wasn't too happy about that. But all I can say is it put us all down for the count for a good 10 days. So you can see why I'm so grateful to be back at the regular routine that makes me so happy each week. With that being said, let's begin. Well, another winter hockey season has begun for many and will soon be beginning for the rest of you in the coming weeks. Tryouts, new teams, new teammates, new coaches, new positions maybe. This only means one thing for me, and that's that I'm going to get a heavier volume of questions from players I train and their parents regarding some early concerns for the upcoming year. This year has been no different, and I thought, If there's one player or parent with a question or looking for some advice out there, I figured there's probably going to be someone else out there who will have the same concern. So I thought, why don't just invite a guest on the show and have a quick conversation with someone who's been there, done that, and is currently passing on her wisdom to others who are gearing up for another winter hockey season. All of the people who have contacted me so far this fall are female players or their parents. And the first person that came to mind to have on the Hockey Journey podcast to help me is former Minnesota Golden Gopher, former Wyzetta Girls head high school hockey coach, and today she's currently working with former NHLer, Hall of Famer, and now master coach Adam Oates from the Oates Sports Group. The young lady I'm referring to is none other than former guest from episode number 32, Taylor Williamson. Miss Williamson, welcome back to the Hockey Journey Podcast. Lance, it's great to be back. Thanks for having me again. Yes. Uh I'm excited. We've you know, we've kind of branched off. Well, you know, give a little uh background. Uh let's rewind uh a year ago. Uh I was trying to groom you to maybe come, you know, spend a few hours a week working with players doing what I do. Uh, since you're, you're so familiar with the program. Uh, my boys work with uh, the guy that I mentioned in the intro, Adam Oates. Uh, they still currently work with him. And he was looking for someone to maybe help him here in Minnesota. And that was last summer. Made the introduction. And uh, you don't work for me. <laughs> you work for him now. So uh, I lost you, but uh, I, I couldn't be more happy for you. How has uh, the last year been? And you just finished your first summer of, uh, you know, hardcore training with the, uh, the Oats sports group. How's everything going with that? Tell me about that experience so far. You know, Lance, I have, I have you to thank for so much of this and where I'm at today. Um, It was, it was you really challenging me and pushing me in in deep thought of, you know, what I really want to do. Um, what my purpose is here with, with the career I had, with the life experiences I've had. And so, you know, a big, a big thanks to you for really having me kind of evaluate what I'm wanting to do with my life. Um, and so, 
you know, seeing what you do with all of your players and then, you know, getting to be introduced and learn from Adam and see what he does with all of his NHL players and, and being able to take those philosophies and apply it to my players in the local area um, and beyond all the way from the youth level, all the way up to the Olympians and, and even NHL players as well has just been so much fun. Um, And it's crazy to look back at that. It's already been a year um, and to see the way that our teaching directly impacts these, these guys in their season Um, but also just in life as well. So I'm absolutely loving it. It's been great so far. And so a big thanks to you for really pushing me into this area. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's been fun. I mean, uh, if you're, if people aren't familiar um, with Adam Oates, uh, uh, a quick overview, uh, he played in 1,337 NHL games, put up 341 goals, 1,079 helpers for a total of 1,420 points. Um, I pulled a hammy right there just thinking about all those games, Taylor. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, He had a six-year coaching career with uh, the Tampa Bay Lightning, New Jersey Devils, and Washington Capitals. Uh, Is currently the head honcho, as I mentioned, of the Oats Sports Group where he's passing on his knowledge of the game, uh, working with some of the superstars in the NHL today, like Kucherov, McKinnon, McDavid, Kachuk, Zegras. Uh, like I said, my boys work with him as well. And now you are learning from uh, the master. Uh, I've, I've been able to see him in action with the boys and then um, see this, like you said, see the, the transition from – being working with you guys and you know all the stuff that you're teaching these players and to actually see it transfer on the ice like almost immediately is is so cool to see so i can imagine that you're just having a blast so i'm rambling i want to uh get you talking more but um like i mentioned i got this time of year i always have players and parents contacting me when the, the year's starting because everything's new and maybe you're you're not uh you didn't make the team that you want uh you're playing a new position and that's one of my uh questions i want for you and why don't we just start from there um so i get questions from players and parents you know different things uh maybe they're not the uh, opportunity that they were going to get this year is a little different because of a coaching change whatever But we're going to talk about a few things. We're going to talk about face-offs. If someone's new to uh, taking face-offs, doesn't know anything, uh, the word on the street was that you were uh, a technician in in that area. So we're going to uh, kind of give the people out listening a a quick overview on just some certain things, you know, some bullet points, a guide, a blueprint that, all right, a checklist that when you're going in there, you're going to be best prepared. And then... Um, you know, the other thing I want, you've worn a few hats as a player and a coach and now as a trainer, um, you know, going to talk to a coach if, you know, you have some questions or, you know, you're, you're thinking that maybe you should get some more opportunities, some more ice time, uh, to have that conversation with a coach and, you know, let's, let's wear a couple hats, one as the player, uh, cause there's that perspective and then the other as the coach, uh, because, um, I learned once I started coaching that, you know, um, there are completely different worlds and a lot of the things that I thought of as a player didn't even pop into the, you know, that, that it wasn't even what the coach was thinking about. It's not, it doesn't even come up on the radar, mm-hmm. but let's start with face-offs. Okay. Someone that really doesn't know anything about it. Um, as a coach, a coach for 17 years, youth hockey, you know, I got to pass some stuff on most of the time. I just, you know, get an assistant coach that really knew stuff about draws. But a couple of things that I would um, start with is just tell the the person who is playing center, who's going to be taking the draw. You're like the quarterback in hockey though. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, you kind of huddle up quick, uh, let everyone know kind of what the game plan is. Um, I guess then everyone goes to their position as the center is entering the circle, going towards the dot, you're going to check, the the hand of who you're going to be going against uh when the when the um 
you're getting close to the dot, you're taking a wide stance, and you're also your hands are wide on the stick where your bottom hand's closer to the blade. Uh, you're not watching the uh, the opponent. You're watching the the ref and the pucks in his hand and in her hand and um, and watching that come down. And that's about all I would give. And then you know win it, win win the draw, whatever you know. Let them know what's going on. But uh, let's learn from someone who's played the position. Um, what are some tips that you can give uh, some players out there that haven't had a lot of experience taking draws, Taylor? I mean, you you hit a lot of the the foundation. That's for sure, Lance. I would say, you know, a, a major the the most important thing and, and the first step is as a player, and this doesn't just land on a on a center, but for players to understand that a faceoff is an opportunity within the game to capture momentum. Um, I don't think that that gets highlighted enough until the college level. Like it truly is a missed opportunity at the high school level, frankly. Um, and so I think step number one is understanding the the impact of just that qu- quick pause in a game and understanding, okay, like we could get a huge opportunity out of this, whether it's in the offensive zone, neutral zone or D zone. Um, so that's that's step number one for me. Um, like you just said, following up with that, it's it's coming up with a face-off play. So you're not just checking with everybody out, that's out there with you, but it's saying, okay, like we're going to run hammer or, you know, run quick hit, wh- whatever it is that you're wanting to do and making sure that everybody out there is on the same page. Because it just takes one, one person. It's usually a D, like that weak side D that's going, wait, what are we doing? You know, I, I didn't hear you. So as the centerman really being the leader on the ice, making sure everybody hears you, you know, then, like you said, you kind of creep in towards that dot, see if the, the other team is set up in any specific way so you can correct, you know, correct your your line mates out there. Um, but then, you know, the really the, the real art of the faceoff itself, you know, for me, um, learned this from my grandpa, is you always want to put your stick down last. And... To me, you know, now working with with Otzi, when you go even deeper in thought with that, it's, you know, understanding how quickly can you create an action? You know, do you do you feel like can you do something that all of a sudden creates like a sensation that goes through your stick to your hands to your brain that's going, okay, like there's something that's about to happen really fast. There's an action that's about to go. Um And so to get there, you know, it's important that you come in last, you've got that wide stance. Um, For me, posture is a really important thing. So you see some players that are too far bent over. So for me, I like a nice athletic position where I'm going to be able to go forward if I need to, or obviously if you need to back up at all or spin or twist out of anything, like you're in a, you're in a very neutral position that's going to allow for you to have different options. You're not just hunched over and going to fall on your face. Um, and when it comes to my hands and my arms, you know, there's some players that go really wide. And personally, I don't like that. Um, I like it obviously wider than my shoulders, but I don't like my hand too far down, like too close to the blade. Cause I've learned from experience that it just takes one really smart centerman on the other side to hack you on the wrist and you kind of respect that because it hurts like, you know, it hurts really bad. So <laughs> yeah. I could, I could say hurts like hell, but um, players know that's, it doesn't, that's not a good feeling. So I go a little bit higher up on my stick, but it allows for me when, once you are looking and you alluded to this, once you're looking at the ref's wrist, you're not looking down, but you're watching when that puck goes, you should already know your plan going into the faceoff. Are you going to whack their stick away so that you can come swipe back and get that puck cleanly? Um, are you going against, you know, as a lefty, are you going against a righty where you're better off sweeping underneath their heel? Are you on the left side of the ice, on the right side of the ice? Are you better just taking a tie up because that day you seem to be kind of off on your reaction time? Um, So there's a lot that's happening in a very short amount of time, right? Like everything I'm talking about happens in about four seconds. 
What happens if someone, so you're, you're saying, you know, all these different options, what you can do, but let's just say here's, here's someone that this got put into center and going in there for her or his first draw, you know, are, are, are they thinking about going to the forehand? What's, what's the easiest way to, to take a draw first? What are you strongest at on the backhand or the forehand? So it's going to be a lot easier for people on their backhand side. Um, but it's great. Like there's, there's advantages to, to your forehand side as well. So I'm a left-handed player. Um, so let's just say theoretically we're lined up on, on the right side of the ice. So for me, what you do is, is you're obviously in that lower stance, but don't be perfectly squared up. Like you always kind of want to angle your feet so that you have a little bit of an advantage there. And I always like to come across the dot. So I would, I would, basically block out I called it a whack like you whack the other player's stick so that you can cleanly come back on your forehand side and you just swipe the puck because you've already basically excluded them from trying to get that puck off the face off um and so if you're able to be quick enough and beat that player and tie up their stick faster you're already at a huge advantage so in all reality I tell my centermen's like of course you're going to have a side that you favor but if, if you truly understand the art of winning a face-off, you shouldn't have a favorable side because you should know your your tools that you have depending on where you're at in the ice. Awesome. What, uh, you know, you talk about communication and making sure you have a plan coming in there and that uh, the other team knows. Uh, you know, I think that the other a few things to, to help players is to to watch I mean, the game, how many draws happen in the game? If you're new to that position, you know, watch what other players are doing. Watch every draw and see what the the ones that are winning draws, you know, what what are they doing? Because that's that can be your best teacher, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it's so funny, like to that point, you know, you hear you hear players or you you hear parents complaining, saying, oh, I want my kid on power play or I want them on, on PK so that they get more ice time and more puck touches. And it's like, I want to flip the script and say like, take advantage of the time that you get. So if you're out there for a face off, you should be understanding like that's the equivalent of getting out there on special teams. Because if you win possession of that puck, that is about 25 less seconds that you're having to chase down the puck, get it back, cause a turnover and then go, go the other way into the offensive zone. So if you're if you're really focused on winning that clean, there you go. That's 25 more seconds of offensive opportunity that could translate into a point. So for you, for mom, for dad, who's overly analyzing how many points you're getting, starting with faceoffs is a huge. It's a great platform to start from. It is, and you know, I I look at, I always tell players that. You know, and I, I, one thing that I was a stickler on is there, there wasn't anyone having long shifts <laughs> out there. You know, they didn't hear uh, me on the bench much, uh, uh, players that were on the ice, but when they heard deep, loud, that meant whoever had the puck by the red line, get it deep, look to make sure it got deep and then change. So you're talking about puck possession, how important that is. I wanted my players 45 seconds under a minute, in between 45 seconds and a minute, you're changing. And if you don't win that draw, you're you're chasing. And then when you do get possession, maybe at 30 seconds, you're hearing coach yell deep because you did your job. You didn't get scored on. Now get it deep because you didn't have possession right away. But that is so critical. And like you said, if you're, you know, if you're unprepared, you're just going to be chasing and you're not going to have what I call easy minutes. Defensive yep. zone, hard minutes. Offensive zone, easy minutes. We want to play in there as much as we can. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's so true. And for, for all the youth players and high school players that are, are listening to this, for you guys to take advantage this season and really creating a solid foundation of what it looks like to be a good centerman and take good face-offs, I'm telling you right now, when you get to the college level, that's only going to play to your advantage because the coach at the end of the day – is going to put out the centerman that they believe is going to win the draw because yeah. the college level, 
like we've just talked about, that's a huge opportunity for your team to get momentum. So if you're a freshman fighting for minutes, if you have the ability to win faceoffs, that right there is a super valuable asset. So start working on it right now. Awesome. All right. I want to touch on a couple more things uh, before we move on to the, to the next topic. Um, you know, if you have, if you communicate well on draws, doesn't matter if it's in the, the offensive zone or defensive zone, but if you as the center say, Hey, I don't have a lot of experience. I'm just going to tie up this player's stick and just try to kick it out. My, my wingers, you guys come in there, you gals come in there and grab the puck and try to get it to the D. Uh, and the other is losing intentionally. Those are a couple of things that uh, we should touch on a little bit because uh, if, if everyone's on the same page, you can catch the other team off guard quite a bit. Yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, one of my one of my best friends – um, Kara Piazza, she played with me at the at the Gophers. She was a captain. Um, she ended up on the ice about every single faceoff. Like for her, that was her ring. Um, and and she literally would battle so hard. Like she was phenomenal at tying up. And and it's like if you don't end up on the ground, like you did it wrong. And so players, I say that it's like you can laugh at it, but that that face off alone like it it takes effort it really does it takes effort it takes strength it takes balance it takes quickness but for you to be low enough and and have that ability to really commit to it um don't be surprised if you end up on the ice it's a good thing because all of a sudden you do make life easy on your wingers to come pick that puck up and now you're going the other way um and so i think if you're a beginner and you just want to start there that's a great place to start yeah Awesome. Um, the one, the, the last thing that I, I wanted, I mean, and these are all great points. Thank you, Taylor. I mean, I think that anyone that's listening right now has a, a pretty good checklist that they can uh, put together, you know, and even I remember when I was trying to remember things, I would put a tape, a little piece of paper on my glove, you know, kind of like the, the football quarterbacks do have the thing on their wrist just mm -hmm. as little reminders. So, um, do that. Is there any, what, what are some ways that uh, players can practice taking draws off the ice in tennis shoes? Is there, is there a way to do that? Um, I mean, there, there definitely is get your buddy, you know, get a couple buddies and, and, you know, obviously have one of you dropping the other one right against you. One of the best things I learned, it was when I was able to um, go out to the uh, U under 22 national camp in Lake Placid um, the national team was there practicing with us. And at the end of every practice centers would go over and work on draws. Um, and a name that everyone's going to recognize, um, is Brianna Decker. Um, mm -hmm. and that honestly was where I learned, um, how crucial and how technical a centerman's position is because what the coach was doing was he wasn't doing like a clean drop. Like it was bouncing on its edge. Like, so it's like, you're working on, the quickness, the skill itself of what you're doing with your stick and your body, but you're also having to watch with your eyes. Like, can you knock it out of the air? Can you get it on the second effort? Right. Cause sometimes you're not going to win it clean on your first, your first swing. Right. It takes a second or third effort at times. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't do that off ice as well. So doing, doing draws where you're trying different things and they don't have to be a perfectly clean drop, have it bounce on its edge right? Do, do different things like that, where now you're working on that coordination of, of winning that on it, on your second or third effort, um, is going to help a ton. Perfect. All right. Well, we'll try to, you know, put that into a, a short little list, uh, at the end here, once we finish up, but, um, really, really good. Um, little nuggets for someone out there that doesn't have a lot of experience. Uh, YouTube um, is another great place to get. Uh, there's a bunch of videos. I was checking that the last couple days uh, watching those. There's a lot of uh, people that have put some videos on best practices and how to win more face-offs. So it's, uh, it's not something you're going to be great at right at the start, but uh, I love that you said that there, the, some of the players that you respect, uh, respected and learned a lot from, 
that was their that was their uh, scoring a goal in a game. You know, mm-hmm. for me, it was maybe making a big hit or blocking a shot. Uh, some people, I you know, there's players that are, have long NHL careers, long longer than they should be playing, and it's just for that role in the playoffs is to take draws. Yep. <laughs> Yep. Uh, so, you know, some people are, aren't uh, aren't gifted to, to score goals and get points all the time. But uh, there there's a role that, you know, if you want to spend the time and becoming a master at it, most aren't, other players won't. And that's uh, face offs is one one spot that you can definitely gain a competitive advantage uh, over a lot of players. And, you know, to create more opportunities for yourself because of that, uh, that I guess, uh better than average skill set. Totally. All right. So you as a player, um, I'm sure had conversations with uh, coaches. I mean, um, wanted a little more opportunity, maybe, you know, when things aren't going well, you want some feedback. Um, Let's talk a little bit about that. When, you know, a a player comes into a, a team situation and, you know, Maybe it's a youth player, and they're they're used to playing forward, you know, their their whole career, and all of a sudden the team needs uh, someone to play defense. Uh, you know, doggone well that you're going to have a parent calling you <laughs> if their kid's been playing forward their whole life, and all of a sudden is playing a rotation at D. Um, what is it? Let's let's start with the coach first. You know, you were a head coach at the high school level. I had a few years as an assistant coach, but at the head coach, you got to take all of the the calls from the parents and the players, but you know, how as a coach, when a player comes to talk to you, how would you feel? Are you like, you know, why are you bothering me? You know, practice, or do you like it when a a player comes in to chat with you? I love it. When a, when a player comes and and talks to me, Um, I it's, and it's not a phone call. It's not a text, but it's them not knocking on my door, coming into my coach's room, sitting down with me, and us having a conversation there. Um, I instantly had respect because so many kids these days with their phones are afraid to put their screen down and look at someone eye to eye. And so for me as a coach, I loved the open line of communication. I, I wanted it from them. And so because of that re- mutual respect, I'm going to give it right back to them. So if a player's saying, coach, I want to play on special teams – well, okay, it, you know, in my perspective as the head coach, I might not think they're ready. So it's not just saying, hey, sorry, like, you're not going to get that. It's going, okay, like, I love, I love your drive. I love your ambition to want to get there. Like, we, we are athletes, we're competitors. So, so keep that fire, keep that determination to get there. Here are a few things that I need to see from you that I think are going to benefit you and put you in a position where you can make an impact in that position. Right now you're not there, but let's continue to work on it. Like I'll help you get there. Um, and there might be even situations where, you know, they're going coach, like, you know, what they might come in and say, what do I have to do to get onto the second line? And that, that is one of my favorite questions. It's, it's not demanding saying, this is what I want. It's, Hey coach, what do you need to see from me in order to get to a result that I want? Yeah. Because at the end of the day, it's about the team. And so, you know, is is I know and understand like you're going to do what's best for the team and not the individual, but this is something that I'm hungry for that I want. So, what do I got to do to get there? Um and I and I always love those conversations with kids. So, what would you what advice would you give a player that has never talked to a coach before, like uh, approach the coach from player to coach, not the coach coming and, and talking to the player, but okay, you, you want to, you want to get more ice time. You want to get more opportunity. How does a player, would you suggest to them? How do they prepare for that conversation? What are some bullet points that they can, uh, you know, that'll provide some good impact if they uh, spend a little time thinking and uh, executing that. I always say the best, the best conversationalists are the ones that go in with wanting, wanting the other person's opinion. So go in with that question, coach, what do I have to do to get on the second line coach? What do I have to do to get on power player penalty kill? And then you sit there and you 
actually listen. Listen to the words that they have to say. And then you say, thank you. Can you clarify this for me? Or, okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, here's a couple other questions. Like, what, what do you like, what do you actively need to see me do on the ice for me to get to that spot? And can you work? Okay. You're saying I need to work on my breakouts. Like I'm not breaking the puck out consistently. Would you be willing after practice to throw me a few pucks and can we work on that skill together? Yes. That's, that's a huge one players out there to think about because coaches are, we're, we're all, you know, we're handing out suggestions like it's candy, but unless you make them accountable, you know, if they're saying you got to do X, Y, Z, and if you say, okay, thank you, uh, nothing really happens. But if they say you got to do X, Y, Z, and you say, hey, coach, awesome. Can you work with me? Or can someone work with me at practice? Now, all of a sudden, you know, you put the ball in their court and they have to be, you know, become a coach. But with that being said, if a kid came to me and said, hey, can you pass me some pucks for one timers or can, you know, do something with me after practice or in a quiet time. I'm all over that. I respect that player way more than if they never would have said anything to me. hundred percent. And obviously with, you know, what I do with old sports group, I'm a huge fan of video. And a lot of these kids these days, you, you get your, your shifts, your games recorded. Um, and so it might be, it might even just be a frustration. Like you might feel like you're in a rut to say, coach, can we go over my shifts together? Like, I just want to see what you're seeing. You know, what am I doing well in your eyes, but what do I need to work on? Um, and, and I love, I love that. Like, like video is such a powerful tool and kids, if you aren't watching your games back just by yourself, like, like I love watching games alone. Oh, like, I can't believe I didn't see that. Right. Or, oh, wow. That was a lot more. I had a lot more time and space than I thought you learn so much just by watching it over again. Um, and then, you know, so, and then you can bring it to your coach and watch it over a second time. So that's another really major resource. Um, and notice how not once did I ever talk about parents. Parents do not need to be involved in any of that. Yeah. Um, and so it, it really is a great life skill for players to learn and understand how to communicate with an adult, with someone in a higher than them um again it's it's a, another beautiful little segment of athletics that you know branches out into other areas of our life isn't that the truth isn't that the truth okay well you're just uh you're just passing it on i love it uh just so many good things last thing i kind of want to just touch on you know you're talking from the coach's perspective but you know when i was when I was a player, it's like, I think I mentioned it at the beginning, but it's like the, the coaches, they don't, they don't know crap. You know, you're sitting in the back of the bus or back of the plane after a loss. And, you know, we got it all figured out as players, but then you're not a player no more. And you put the coach's hat on, you know, there's so many things that I was thinking about as a player that it doesn't even register with the coach because they have so many other things that are going on uh with with being a coach you know and mm -hmm. you got parents calling you know you got you're not managing this one kid you got 17 players that you got to manage uh yep. and all that so it, it becomes a lot so I, I i guess you know from from when you when you if you think about when you were a player and and you know a head coach in there you know did you always have in the back of your mind you know to think about before you even spoke about anything, you know, what, what is, what does the player think? You know, I never want to forget what it was like to be a player because I I've experienced, and I, I think everyone has at some point that you, you get in front of a coach that it was a player and you're like, Holy cow. When did you forget what it was like to be a player? Yep. You know, so how would you touch on that subject? I think that as a trainer today, that is the one of the most important things I do is I put myself in their shoes. Um, and I think obviously I'm at an advantage because I've, I've recently retired 
And so, you know, it's still a lot of fresh things that you think about and remember, but that for, for coaches listening, for trainers listening, that is the most powerful tool you can use. Um, I think hockey has become such a skilled game that we forget we're just here to play hockey. We forget about playing the game. You get to, you know, like at the end of the day, what we do at sports group, it's, it's very detail oriented. But then at the same time, we always, always pull it back to we're playing hockey. Like, yes, you're working on a skill, but it's not just about the skill. It's about the game. And I think that shows our inner player coming out, you know, or you think about in the midst of a long season, it might be around Christmas time, that little hump that you have to go over coaches understand your players are tired. They're going through school. They're going through all like who knows what's going on at home. And it's been months of late night practices, early morning wake ups, doing all these things. And so, you know, to understand when to give your players grace, when to push them. Um, and that that also really tees up a team for a lot of success. That it does. That it does. And, you, you know, and that and you think about, you know, when the the coach finding the pulse of the team, you know, are they tired and stuff? And, you know, there's a there's a lot of players, you know, not I, I would say, you know, maybe 25 percent on most teams that, you know, you got this the, the higher end group that they're doing the extra stuff. They're doing a breakfast club. They're they're on the pond in the winter. They're in their basement uh, backyard or garage getting extra reps doing that. They're they're watching film, um, working with specialty coaches in a lot of different areas. So it's 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 hard. But mm-hmm. again, I, I I think that the the message here is for for players out there is that coaches are not unapproachable. We we love to uh, have players come up uh, and ask us, you know, how can how can you get more opportunity? How can what do you need to do differently to to help the team, uh, you know, win more hockey games and be more successful? But uh, you know, I, I hope that this has helped, you know, some some players out there that maybe were questioning that and and, and to to players in the future. But don't be afraid to talk to your coaches. But go in there prepared and. Um, you know, be, be, uh, humble and know that the, the head coach has uh, a lot of things that they're trying to manage. You know, you don't think about how much time it takes to plan a practice, but there's time, you know, Mm -hmm. in that. And, you know, most coaches, uh, unless they're playing, you know, in college or pro professionally, most coaches have a a full-time job too. And then to have to deal with parents. So, uh, get a good, it's like school. You know, you want to have a good relationship with your your teacher because, you know, at some point, you know, you're going to have to go in there and talk to her and say, hey, I kind of struggled on that test. And if you'd never talked to the teacher or the coach, you know, you're probably not going to get what you want that first crack at it. But, uh, you know, and it's good, good things for, you know, later in life. You know, getting a 10 year old to go talk to a coach is pretty intimidating, isn't it? You know, I'll think back to that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's gonna, it's, you know, you're not going to do it perfectly guys. It, it's going to take time. And let's say, let's say you go in, you talk to a coach, you get out of there. You're like, Oh, that wasn't great. I, you know, I feel like I, you know, said this wrong and it was taken the wrong way or, you know, I reacted the wrong way. If you recognize that, go walk back in the room and apologize, whether it's after practice or the next morning coach, I just wanted to say like, I was, thinking about our conversation all last night and I just want to apologize like I I spoke you know I I didn't respect you in that conversation and so I'm really sorry about that like don't be afraid don't be afraid like you said Lance to be humble um because a good coach also understands like everyone's growing and learning coaches are going to make mistakes players like you're going to make a mistake it's not perfect right away so for you to be confident enough in yourself to say, Hey, I was wrong in this situation. I'm sorry. Holy, holy cow. Does that go a long way? Awesome. Um, and that's, that's, that's so important. You know, it is because, you know, we're not seasoned veterans. We're not calm in those because we, you know, as a, as a young player, 
if you, you haven't had those experiences, those reps, so you're going to go on there and probably going to make some mistakes. And that's exactly, I, I didn't even think about that, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, and you'll have the coach come and say that to you too after. I remember, yeah. <laughs> I remember Jacques Martin, he was so mad at uh, after, in, when I was playing in Ottawa, so he comes into the room and he didn't yell at us very often, but he was mad that game after that game. And he, he was French and sometimes, you know, the, the, the French and the English got a little mixed up. And, but anyways, <laughs> he's, he's ranting and raving, yelling at everyone. And then the last thing that he said, he goes, we're not going to win games with our, our best player is one of our worst players. <laughs> and he pointed, <laughs> and he pointed to me something like that. Uh, you know, he can barely skate. So to give you, you know, it's the flip side is that the next day at practice, before practice started, he pulled me into his office and he said, ah, Lance, you know, that was meant to be a compliment that you were really good. You were our best player. And I, I said, I get it, coach, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so anyways, all right. Well, uh, thank you again. I just, I, I can't thank you enough. There, there's just so many great things. And you know, I haven't been coaching for, for a while, so I forget that, you know, that part of the game. But, you know, I'm, I'm lucky that I, I, I get in front of enough players and parents that it kind of keeps me in there. But this was really fun, and I, I'm going to ask anyone out there, if you uh, have any other questions or topics you'd like us to chat about, I'd love to have you back on the show here. Taylor, this is so fun reconnecting with you. I haven't seen you in so long. Yeah, no, anytime. Thanks again for having me. Um, where, cause now you're, um, you're still the real estate, aren't you in real estate? Some, yep, um, yep. For, for tradition mortgage in Edina. So still there, it's obviously a, a slow market. So it's fun to be able to fill my time with some coaching and some hockey. Yeah. If people want to learn more about what you got going on with the, uh, the Oats sports group, uh, where can they get some more information about, uh, you and what's going on there? So yeah, they can just Google oatsportsgroup.com and they'll be able to see all about what we do, um, the 60 to 70 NHL players that we work with, and then our contact information is on that page. So anytime people have questions, want to reach out, um, are curious about what it is like to work with our program and and with me in the area, um, more than happy to have that conversation with them. Yeah, awesome. I'll put that, uh, the link to there uh, in the description and yeah i would uh love to have you back on here we didn't uh i guess real quick what's uh how cool is it this new uh women's professional league I mean, what does that mean to that uh, to the sports for the female side oh uh, i'm so glad you have touched on it i mean this is monumental for women's hockey and for girls i couldn't be more excited for you and for your future because now the work that you're putting in, there is a clear return on investment. You guys can make a living being professional hockey players. Um, and I talk about it with all my college players that I work with. And I mean, I work with Grace Umwinkle, who was just drafted to Minnesota, right? So yeah. now, now there's an added level to our game that's similar to the guys that we can talk about long- longevity. We can talk about the importance of little skill specific things that you do with me that you do with Lance and so to see that get put into our game is so exciting and I can't wait to see you know where our game goes now that this is an option for our future women's hockey players yeah I couldn't be more happy as well Um, there's been a number of players over the years that I've uh, worked with that you could tell towards the end of their college career, they were getting pissed, (laughs) you know, because, you know, they wanted to continue like the boys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's uh, hard when you're, when you know you've got a clock on your career and there's nothing else you can do about it. So to know that they can graduate and continue to pursue their, the sport they love and make good money from it is unbelievable. It's really exciting. Awesome. All right, young lady, I won't take any more of your time up. Uh, We'll do this again. But uh, all you people out there, uh, get a piece of paper down and re-listen to the face-off segment. Write down um, what you're hearing. You know, the the one that uh, that I never really thought about much because you're always thinking about 
uh, the technique of everything, but why you're actually taking a face off and how you said it, you know, it's an opportunity to, to gain momentum and to get possession of the puck. And what I added on to that, you know, if you got the puck, those are easy minutes. Let's get to the offensive zone. Let's get, you know, stay out of the defensive zone, you know, have a plan, uh, your little sneaky squirrel attack, uh, put your stick down last. And I think, think fast athletic position, you know, a little wider stance with the hands. You'll, you kind of mentioned that, um, you know, you're, there a lot of people are really wide. You kind of had a more modified and I think it's with anything you take all the information and puzzle pieces and you just use whatever ones make you the most successful. But, um, Again, anything else to add with the face-offs or anything else? Because I think that this is a wrap for this segment, and it's another awesome one. That's all I got. It was a great, great talking with you, Lance. Okay, perfect. Well, um, enjoy the the uh, the fall here. I know that you guys, your parents have a, a lake place. I'm sure you're going to spend a weekend or two up there uh, taking in the fall colors. But uh, you and I will have to get together for lunch here down the road it's been uh been a while since we got face to face that'd be awesome would love to all right perfect well all the best and if you want to learn more about miss taylor williamson head on over to the old uh, uh oats sports group i'll put the the link in the description to learn about what she's going on what she has going on and how she's making and helping hockey players get to the highest levels so thanks again taylor for being here and have a great rest of your week Thanks. Well, that concludes another episode of the Hockey Journey Podcast. I can't thank you enough for stopping by and listening. I hope you found some useful information and tips if you're new to taking face-offs and if you haven't had much experience speaking with your coaches during a hockey season. Lastly, if you think there's someone in your circle of family and friends that might like this episode as well, please share it with just one person. It would really help me in growing this hockey community. Again, I appreciate you being here. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, or submit a review. I hope to see you back here soon. And do me a favor, make someone close to you smile today. All the best, my friends.